Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, wherever, whatever time it is, wherever you're calling in from. I'm so happy to be back and to see you. Uh, and, and I've got some lovely people here that are going to be talking with you all about VCIO services, QBRs. Um, yeah, I like the energy, Kyle. Kyle, it's like 4 a.m. for Kyle. Um, this is what he does every day. Um, good morning, More coffee. everyone. Uh, let us know where you're coming in from. Use the chat. Uh, enjoy the, the revel in the non-AI generated chat uh, that we offer here. Um, these are real human beings as far as we know. Um, yeah, good to see you, Misty, Robert. Thanks for jumping in. Um, we like to do things pretty interactive and, and loosely here at Ninja One with our webinars. Um, I am Jonathan Crow, Director of Community, and I'm going to tee up our guests here uh, in just a second. Before I do that, I uh, just wanted to give a few, you know, the standard housekeeping stuff, because it's been a while since we've had these. Um, so uh, first of all, this is going to be recorded. Check that box. Uh, we will be sending out the recording, an email with all of the resources that we're going to be sharing. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, second, um, let us jump in. We're not going to wait for the end for a Q&A thing. We want you guys to be, that's right, get right in there. Uh, use our chat. Uh, let everybody know. Call Kyle out. Call Marnie Alex out. Ask your questions. Also, I've noticed um, we've got folks on the line uh, here that are in, in, the, in the chat that are like Eric uh, from Knoxville. I grew up in Johnson City, Tennessee, so shout out for Tennessee, Northeastern Tennessee there. And um, Eric, I noticed that you are a VCIO. So you're going to hear from us. You're going to hear from these smart folks. We want to hear from you too and share your experiences. One of the cool things that uh, about all these events is this is a chance for you to connect with peers, get other insights. So definitely let it rip in the chat. With all that said, let me introduce you to your very special speaker guest here. So first... We've got Kyle Christensen. He's the founder of K7 Leadership, uh, which you can go to the website right there. Kyle is a uh, former MSP himself, and now he's helping MSPs really level up their growth. Um, he's helping them work on their business. He's their witness when they're working on their business. And uh, Kyle, we, we guessed that you're an Aries. Is that is that right? No, man, I'm a Pisces. Come ah. on, fish swimming upstream <laughs> together. We got to work as a team. All Always right. Gotta have the counterpart. Oh man, I love it. Well, even more appropriate. I, I like that you tie that together there. Um, so I'll I'll update that and make sure um, for the record. <laughs> for the uh, next time we use we use my sign. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Um, feel free to share your, your signs in the chat too. Uh, next we have Marnie Stockman. She's CEO of Lifecycle Insights. A frequent guest of our uh, webinars and our virtual events. I have been uh, with Marnie in um, uh, at an island invaded by dinosaurs. Uh, we've been out in space together. We've done all sorts of stuff together. She likes math. Getting down to brass tacks. Punny puns. And she, like myself, is a Scorpio. Marnie, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> when I saw Kyle's go up, I thought, oh, I wonder what Jonathan has often to say about another Scorpio. <laughs> I think this one, yeah, I mean, for, for those uh, who have been around in our, our Ninja uh, virtual events for a while, uh, we've subjected ourselves to like spicy uh, uh, lollipops and spicy chips. Um, <laughs> truly awful disgusting jelly beans <laughs> and and uh i think i got the reputation for like yeah no don't do those events and so i promised to be pretty good this time so this is like the only thing we're really fooling around with you on i was happy um, when no box showed up at the door <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well hey who is that guy anyway this is alex farling he's co-founder of life cycle insights um alex is a gemini he likes Star Trek. He actually there's doesn't. No, I'm just trolling him right no now. No Star Trek. That is such a troll. <laughs> <laughs> Although at my at my office at my MSP, we did get all the new guys red shirts, and we would joke with them that if we beamed them down to the planet and they didn't come back, it wouldn't be a very big loss. So oh. that was how we trained the rookies. Wow, the red shirts, amazing. Our colors were red and black, so all the new guys got red shirts, and that was the. <laughs> As that you was... can tell from his background there. Um... Yeah, there's a little Star Wars floating around here. Yeah, it's 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 okay. He likes the other one. He likes. Star Wars. <laughs> um, and and there's like a little ninja Lego guy uh, somewhere around the ATAT, -AT, right? Oh, he's in here. He's in here. Hold on. Oh, he's inside. He's right here. Yeah. There's there's the ninja guy. 
Oh, wearing a Batman, yes. Batman hoodie, it. yeah. He's he's rocking it. <laughs> so. This is like so he's he's a ninja Lego guy with a Batman helmet hanging out with the Star Wars folks. Hanging out with Star Wars. All guys. the things. <laughs> Got it. I love it. Um, all right, everybody. So we are here to talk about VCIO services. And I think the first thing we all agreed on was, well, we should probably define what that actually means. And I thought that would be pretty simple. And my guests who are much smarter than I am said, yeah, okay, nice try. It's not simple. So the first thing we're going to do here is uh, we're going to drop uh, a few polls here. Um, so if you go over, look, look um, to the, wait, which side? I don't know. This one, I think. Um, you should see now our, uh, a couple of polls. I'm going to drop, um, are you offering VCI services? Um, that's the first one. Um, and then if so, are you charging separately for them? Or is that part of your packaged offering? Um, while we're at it, what term do you like best? Do you not like VCIO as a term? Do you like something better? We've got fractional CIO. Um, I just toss in like strategic advisor in there. Um, you're just going straight up MSP or, or you, maybe you don't like any of those and you're doing something else. Um, and then we've got one more poll that we'll, we'll drop in a little bit later, but um, while folks are filling out those, um, why don't we start with um, uh, Kyle? Why don't we start with you for, for VCI? When you hear VCIO, what are you thinking about? What am I thinking about? I am thinking a strategic advisor on the informational platforms that a client is utilizing. Right. If I, I think traditional CIO, right? I'm a guy that's been in enterprise. I've been a guy that's worked with bigger teams. And when I hear term CIO, it, I don't hear account manager. So I think that's usually where you're prob we're probably teeing up a little bit. But for me, it's are we budgeting? Are we taking in our risks? And are we looking into the future of how our platforms make us more efficient because I am managing expenses as a company? Okay. And so you bring up a really good point. CIO, I mean, this is a, uh, a C-suite role, right? That kind of implies a certain size, a certain maturity. Um, is that always the case? Are VCI services only for a, a client of a certain size? Depends. I mean, most of our clients have no idea what a CIO is, let alone how their technology can really make them efficient from a productivity perspective, right? So I think it's our job if our clients are a little less mature to talk in languages that they can understand. And so I think that's where us being trusted advisors have to break down that barrier to where, yeah, if you're a you know, a 10 man sh client SMB, you know, there, there's ways that we can do it without trying to overcomplicate it, right? Simple things like to them, Office 365 rather than your AOL account, right? That makes them more efficient because they're not sharing a mailbox. So that to me is still a way of being a CIO for our clients, but we don't have to go in there from a pretentious perspective. Dustin's bringing up a good point here too of um, uh, from the other side, like it's same VCIO when there's a CIO actually involved too and how they interpret that. Um, yeah, pretty interesting. I'm, I'm going to bring up and that's the, a great the, sign though for his MSP, right? That means they're swimming oh, yeah. up market. They're dealing with some more mature companies. Like they're, they're doing more than just working with the, uh, the five to 10 to 25, uh, C clients that, that a lot of MSPs really focus on. So, um, you know, that's why I use the word augmentation there, right? They're really augmenting and assisting the CIO. Okay, cool. Well, um, I'm going to bring up some of the results of the polls here because I think that'll help us uh, guide some conversation. And um, the first one, uh, check this out. So um, are you offering VCIO services? Uh, we got nearly half uh, the folks in the crowd here saying, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and then if you combine that with no, but we're planned to, a lot of people are uh, looking to... Um, to offer this. And so I'm just curious from those who are offering, um, definitely, like I mentioned, like jump in, uh, we could even pull some of you on the, on the stage if you're up for it. Um, uh, but very, uh, interested to hear, um, what exactly that means for you and, and, and how you're doing that and the success you've seen, because I'm sure, um, your peers on the call who are not offering yet or plan to would be interesting. So uh, I appreciate let's... the seven folks down at the bottom that said kind of, because <laughs> yeah. this is a big lift for a lot of MSPs and there's no shame in that. Uh, this is one of those things that it's a journey and uh, it, it, a lot of you are going to be spending some time to get there. So that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. Check this next one out. Are you charging separately? 
and so Kyle, I know this is something that uh, uh, we really want to tee you up on, but before we do, um, you know, packaging this in, maybe Marnie and Alex, going back over to your end, um, that question about are VCIO services only for a, a certain, a, you know, clients of a certain size? Um, I think in our previous conversations, you've said, well, at the at, at a high level, what you're trying to do there, offering truly strategic advice, you know, the budgeting, the road mapping, um, and, and not just doing account management, not just doing sales, that's needed by everybody. Um, but it kind of flows back into uh, this advice that everyone's been given for years and years now. You don't just want to be the tech guy. You want to be a strategic advisor, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. Tell me a little bit about how, when, when you're thinking VCIO versus uh, you know, account management, what, what are, what are the summer separations there? Um, if you're not offering this as like its own separate, uh, line item. Well, I think Kyle will get into, he's got some really good opinions about this. And I don't want to steal them because most of them, uh, most of my insight on that, I really, um, uh, came from a really deep conversation he and I had around this and he's kind of changed my mind a little bit. So I'll let him, uh, let him beat that one up. But, um, you know, my differentiation is, has a lot to do with, what are we really delivering, right? And this is, is it a strategic role or is it a sales role? If it's a sales role, it's not VCIO. If your goal going in is to sell the client something, have them, you know, if you're, if you're, if you, if you're goal driven and walking in the door, hoping to sell them something, it's, that's not CIO services, right? The CIO is strategic. They're operating as a C-level executive for that company. They're probably, we've already mentioned budget. They're probably delivering a budget for the entire IT department, not just for the things that I plan to sell them this year as an MSP. Um, they're really operating at a risk management level and an eff efficiency management level, as opposed to just, hey, did they buy all my stuff? Uh, can I sell them this little $2 security widget that I've, that I've added on to my, um, to my stack this week? Well, Marnie, um, I'll tee you up here because this topic came up during our ITX uh, virtual summit in the fall, um, and you brought a, um, uh, uh, Trisha, who um, is at an MSP with us, one of your uh, lifecycle partners. Yeah, and um, something that came up with her was the, um, as this, you know, uh, Alex, you mentioned the journey, right? Um, as she was taking the journey to try to have more strategic long term conversations, she found uh, that she had to separate that technical onboarding and those conversations yep. Yep. from. Uh, from this other, um, you know, the more, the more strategic call to the point where she would actually book them as completely separate meetings. Um, because if she tried to combine the two, it just wasn't, that conversation wasn't going really to go where it needed water, to water, And then it also muddies the path down the road where they, where, you know, and Alex has often said, if I wore a suit jacket in, nobody expected me to crawl under the table and plug in cables. Right. <laughs> and so that was the same delineation that she was trying to set up by having a technical call and versus a consultative call. Also, who's coming to the party for a technical conversation versus a consultative conversation? The CEO of a small business does not want to sit through and work through every line item of your project plan and look at every asset that's getting replaced or whatever the technical conversation is versus where is your business going in the next 18 months? Are you expanding? Are you contracting? Are you looking at acquisitions, right? That's the business level conversation. So I like who has Adam put chief information ninja as an option for a title in the chat. I got it. I smiled at that. I one. feel like that should um, take off. Like we're going to see that as a, as a post on LinkedIn <laughs> next week. Like we'll, we'll give, we'll credit you with that, Adam, just so you know. Um, so yeah, I think Trisha's conversation went in two distinct pieces. One was she separated the conversations themselves. And also she scaled her process and didn't start right at, uh, you know, if they didn't have it's Maslow's hierarchy. I talk about it all the time. You have to have some foundational data before you can get to the rest of the conversation. And I think that's where you see the, the tactical to strategic climb of both the information you're bringing to ta the table, as well as the skills of the humans that are bringing it to the table and the level of conversation. Well, and the other thing she does so well is she brings client goals to the conversation, right? Yeah. And so often we're so worried about plugging that security hole or selling that next shiny thing that we forget that clients buy because we're supporting something they want to do. And yeah. clients make the right decisions when those decisions align with something they want to do. They don't yeah, care her. about 
you know, they don't care about checking a box on a, on a uh, framework, uh, framework, security framework yeah. that we're trying to solve for, right? So we have to show them how that framework supports their end goals and the, the work that we're doing supports their end goals. Then we end up with a client who's on board for the long term. So is it fair to say, and this is probably really reductive, but like, is it fair to say that there's, um, when we're thinking about the maturity of, um, and the different options, um, of going down this path towards, you know, I want to be eventually uh, serving as a VCIO or, or, or this more strategic role, uh, for my clients, potentially even, uh, charging for it separately at some point. Um, how do we get there in terms of stages? I mean, I think everybody would recommend, okay, you should be having these, you know, whether we call them QBRs or something else, you should be having these, these, uh, discussions that are separate from, uh, this strictly just the, the technical, uh, you know, recap. Um, so there's that element of it, but can you guys kind of like walk me through, are there, are there like some stages to that, that, uh, that, that folks can maybe think about? So I'll start and then Alex can add on, cause we both talk to hundreds of MSPs weekly about what they're doing. And many yeah. folks, if they have had zero conversation, they're starting with, we've got to make sure we've got the right data in order to have the right conversation. Right. If you just jump to wanting to have that business goal conversation, when it comes right down to the brass tacks, which, as you said, I do like to talk about there, there's going to be a huge gap and they're going to fall flat on their face that they haven't gotten the right information to be able to support the high level strategic conversation. So we see folks that start with the basic inventories, right? You've got to have asset lifecycle management inventory. You've got to have user inventory. Both of those things impact the budget, right? So it's not like, we want to sit there and talk about that level, but you have to start there because it's going to impact not just the budget, but the next level up, which is the risk and security component, right? So you level up from some data to security and risk, and then you align both of those pieces to business goals so that you can then talk about their strategic elements, their business goals that Alex talked about with the supporting data. You don't go in there and talk for six hours about every line item, starting from the business goal down to the bottom, like, yep, we're gonna replace this Optiplex 750, but you've gotta have that to build up to it. We had a, a magic moment on a, on a webinar with Augment yesterday. And uh, one of our partners said, uh, you know, I present the budget to my client and it kind of has replaced the entire quoting process, all the BS that goes on. Like we have a strategic document that that overhangs or it like supersedes the when does Kelly in accounting get a new PC and when do we spend money on this, that or the other. And he said, we don't send quotes anymore. We don't argue haggle over pricing anymore. We just we've budgeted enough for it. As long as I come in under budget, we do the work and life is good. And that is so much the evolution from a sales process to a problem solving or a strategic process that we just love to see. Kyle, what about yourself? Um, with your clients that you're working with, um, whether what they're, what they are coming in with or what you're trying to guide them to, um, what does this really look like for them? Um, this may be a little bit different from what, uh, Marnie and Alex are talking about or similar. I think the largest thing for me is, with when my clients are building their pricing or their packaging and we're trying to figure out their target markets so often we have a little bit of identity crisis of what we are trying to help our clients with and i think that takes us out of recognizing that our clients are also small businesses that are trying to manage a budget trying to manage their expenses and they have their own value of what their time is worth so building out really understanding that target market that you are approaching is really what I try to understand and work with my clients. And this whole thing of what is the best practice on price I should sell and should I make it flat fee? I think a lot of it comes with so little context, like to the earlier thing that Alex mentioned of, do I charge for VCIO services? Well, I don't know if it would be a separate line item, but there should be a level of budgeting that goes into how many hours does this target market need per week, per month, per quarter, per year, in order to be a successful VCIO, and then that would go into my flat fee for my clients, right? It's not this whole backwards math of, oh, I'm just going to blanket, say, $190 a user a month, because if I'm doing something at an accelerated level for a very high-touch industry, then I might need more technical consulting with my client or uh, chief information ninja, right? So it, it's this having a discipline to understand that I'm working with my clients, and some, right, I, I knew... 
when I was running mine, I had a client where we had to have a VCIO service every month. It wasn't quarterly review, it was yep. a monthly review because yep. they were in FINRA, which is very high touch from a security perspective. And they were always being thrown this thing left or right. But then you have your CPA where if you showed up every quarter, they're gonna be like, why the hell are you here again, man? I just went to lunch with you two months ago. So it's really working with your clients. They're a small business. They have needs and they want you to help them. They don't want you to sit there and just instantly go, oh, I discovered that this needs to be added to my stack. So buy it now from me, right? We're not account management. Um, and that becomes a different conversation then is how do you manage things like lifetime value, average MRR per month per client, right? How do I then accurately farm those clients and have a strategy to where, yes, I do want to pick up some quarters with my clients, but at the same time, how do I do it in a way, like Alex said, where I'm not sitting there uh, relentlessly trying to get them to sign something that they don't even realize that they want or need? Well, and you said, you know, we're not account management when we're looking at VCIO work. But the, the scarier part of that is sometimes we're at odds with account management, right? Sometimes we're looking at a client budget and operating as a C-level executive at this corporation and saying, we just absolutely can't afford to make any more spend on technology. Um, in fact, we probably are in a position where we shouldn't be spending as much as we are, and we need to address that, right? And, and as a C-level executive at your client's organization, guess what? You have an obligation to support that organization at that level. This isn't where like you're the account manager that just gets to go ring the cash register. And if you're wearing both of those hats, that is a tough tight rope to walk. Right. You're giving your employees an identity crisis at that point, but right. you're also giving your own company identity crisis because if you did it truly as a CIO, right now you've got your CIO being the gatekeeper to the CFO of your client and the account managers working with your own employee. So you're creating this counterbalance now of accountability in your organization to truly look out for the interest of your client. Yep. And that client's going to generate revenue in so many ways that you don't even think about, right? They're going to generate project revenue because the the CIO doing what CIOs do is using technology to support the business, which is going to mean that we do things with technology that generate revenue for projects and things like that, but they're not on a quota. They're not, um, they're, they're time sensitive to the organization. And, and well, and let, let's be realistic here. And this is our, I think we get way too lost. And sometimes as us as MSPs, here's Kyle getting on his stool now, right now and saying, you all just need to sit down is at the end of the day, as MSPs, we make our most margin and profitability off of the managed services, not the projects, not the extra doohickeys that we sell them, right? It is off of our peer billing of managing their infrastructure. So if that is the case, that is what we want to protect the most. So why are we going to annoy them? Why don't we work with them to sell them all those extra things that have lower margin so that that way we can protect the relationship and have a longer average lifespan of our clients rather than, you know, annoy them to death and nickel and dime them to death. Great points. Um, th this may uh, uh, inform our conversation too. So I launched a couple additional polls, everybody. Um, and we've got... Uh, who is conducting the VCIO services? This kind of goes into some points you're making. Um, uh, you know, is it account managers? Because now if we're thinking about um, the feasibility of this and how we're able to offer it, can you really afford to have a dedicated person doing this? And if so, um, how are you budgeting that? How, how are you making that work financially? Um, so I, we asked that question. We also asked, uh, uh, does your VCIO have a quota? Um, so let's, let's see, um, folks are still responding to this, but I'll go ahead and pull it up to see what we got so far. And then, um, uh, maybe Kyle, Alex, Marnie, if you have some reactions. So, um, first of all, who's doing it? What does this actually look like? Um, a lot of cases here for our audience, it's the owner. Um, yep. and a few folks have their dedicated VCIO. Um, we've got, uh, some, some account managers too, no sales reps. I just saw the other one. I don't know. Um, if we're in the green room talking about, you know, this is hard to segment out and make its own job role at a small MSP. Right. Right. There's a Kyle and I are still trying to figure out what the right number is where, uh, you know, your revenue supports having account management and a VCIO. Um, and then this is one of those places where it's really hard for small MSPs to have parity there. Well, I think it's where it muddies up the conversation too, because every MSP is going to have a different organizational structure or strategy on how they want to operate their business. So that even throws into the mix, right? How am I performing sales kind of dictates how I'm doing account management. Yeah. 
Well, and, and being able to create a structure and a process to be able to scale away from the owner so that the owner can go on vacation at some point in their life is really important to pick a path to be able to scale the process, right? You need people, process, and product to make that happen. And it's, it's funny, Martin, because that's the main thing that I my, my offering to my client is that first, we got to get the business to operate by itself. But yeah. second, I need we need the company to grow by itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, well right, said. Keith, your appointment, right, if your clients don't have that trust, you know, to have those strategic discussions, we need to operationalize that. We need to find a way to where that trust can be built into your process because you simply cannot scale with having owner-led account management, VCIO, or sales. Yeah. Let's jump over to this one. Um, does your VCIO have a quota? Uh, <laughs> most people are like, what? Um, and no. So, uh, uh, Kyle, I know uh, you and Alex really <laughs> wanted to toss this one in there. Um, explain yourself. Why, why would you want to ask this question? How can I be looking out for the best interest of my client if I'm also going to lose my job? If I do or, not. Or take homeless money, right? I'm incentivized to bring the cash register, not to, not to look out for my client. Now, here's where I struggle with it internally, like to be transparent, where my own strategic mind gets in the way almost is sometimes quota can be how much revenue you're managing, right? How many clients am I actually being a CIO for? Yeah, so there's there a difference level... between the right KPI and a sales quota. Yes. Right. right. This could be more thought of more as a, a utilization, how much of your out time is billed towards a client, right? We could think of it in terms of a financial utilization not like a PSA utilization. Um, so that's really where we're going towards is. Well, and we also see a lot of success with folks who are using some sort of alignment metric to say, is my client aligned with CIS? And how, how tightly are my clients aligned with CIS or NIST or whatever my framework of choice is? So the CIO's job is to take a, a, a group of clients that are 25% in alignment with best practices and continually quarter over quarter tighten up that alignment and make sure that they're doing more of the right things right. Well, now, that you... doesn't mean you shouldn't have, that you should just throw account managers away though, nope. right? This whole conversation isn't don't have account managers. You know, I, I think that's an important topic because if you don't have quotas, if you don't have people trying to farm your accounts as well, then there is always that potential for margin erosion of those clients. Yep. So we gotta be careful of those instances. But to your point, to have a consultant and then an account manager to follow up with those pieces, right? Because for sure, the consultative services absolutely drive additional projects, additional MRR, additional opportunity, but to not be the one negotiating with them keeps them as a strategic advisor. When I consulted with school systems, I never had a quota. I frankly didn't know how much anything cost, but I knew how to help them solve problems. So our whole conversation was about what are you trying to achieve? What is your strategic plan? Let's talk about how we're implementing it. Are there technologies that can help you improve that? Oh, we happen to have some of those. Great. How much does that cost, Marnie? I have no idea. You can go talk to somebody else about that, right? It just, it separated it. But I wasn't then in the nitty gritty every day of dotting I's and crossing T's on, on sales paperwork. Mm-hmm. However, though, you as a business, though, you still need it. So someone internally in your organization needs to kick you in the butt and say, hey, your client 100%. needs to buy some more stuff. Absolutely. So it's a good counterbalance, right? And as you yeah. build strategy, the whole idea of building strategy of scalable uh, services and teams, right, economy of scale, is you need people in your own company holding each other accountable. It can't just always be the manager or the boss or the owner. So if we step back for a second, we've talked about... Um, you know, what is, what are we even talking about with VCIO services? What does it look like? Um, who is doing it? Um, I'm interested in the chat. Um, we're about halfway through here. If you have specific questions or things that you want us to dig into more, uh, you've got Marnie, Alex, and Kyle here at your beck and call. So um, uh, feel free to, to steer us in a direction. Do you want us um, to, to dig into the thing a little bit further? Uh, we also have uh, uh, a couple of other segments we're going to do. Um, we're going to transition into, uh, Marnie's got something that she's going to show that maybe brings us back into a little bit more of like a tactical approach, um, showing some things in life cycle that you can do in terms of what, um, uh, information you need and how you can gather and deliver that, 
uh, to have some of these conversations. And then we're also going to have a, um, a little bit of a matchmaking game. It's Valentine's week. Um, <laughs> Okay, so but this is a great question. So SS, um, question. <laughs> yeah. So, so because I mean, to me, uh, hearing this, it seems like it sounds like what, what we're really saying is that there needs to be there need to be different types of conversations happening with your clients, ideally, and those conversations need to be um, uh, not in a vacuum, but they need to be siloed a little bit. Um, or that's that's seen as kind of having to be more effective. So you've got your technical conversations that are more like nuts and bolts of things. Um, but then you're having the, the larger kind of, uh, strategic discussions. Um, and then, uh, and then of course there's like the sales element too. Um, is that fair to say, am I being too like, uh, simple about this or, uh, no, I think it's incredibly simple. It's incredibly simple. Like th there are, there are two different types of, of conversations that we kind of lump things into at lifecycle insights and that's strategic and tactical, right? Tactical is could have been a ticket, could have been an email, could have been a phone call, but we can solve it with one of those really easy things, right? Um, tactical is how is a service level uh, where, where we're failing on a service level or, um, you know, not meeting client expectations or need to sell them a product or a service, right? Ticket, email, phone call, we can handle something like that. Um, strategic is the larger um, things that are going to take weeks, months, years to come to fruition to, to be part of a longer term process. And those are a different conversation. And we're firm believers that if you're having service delivery issues, your VCIO should be removed from that conversation. Your service manager should head up that conversation. And the account manager probably is involved in that as well because it's a retention issue. It's a, it's a churn issue. It's a customer satisfaction issue that they need to be on top of and they need to know what they're managing. So that's my take. Um, you know, interested to hear if somebody else has a different one, but we really separate strategic from tactical and let the, the account manager take tactical and the VCIO take strategic. So one of the things from a slightly different perspective, the VCIO really high level, you know, we've talked about not everybody deserves a quarterly business review, right? Some of them should be annually. Some of them should be semi-annually. The monthly ones, by golly, I have a VCIO on that one, right? But if you're trying to train an account manager to do more consultative type of work, some of those annual clients, so we sort of had a top tier consultant and then the customer success managers would take the smaller accounts and they learned that I really want to go down the path of customer success. I really want to become a sales rep or I want to be trained technically to become more of a VCIO type of role um, because it's hard to scale the single VCIO into a tremendous number of accounts. It wasn't the exact same setting. So I'm sure Kyle's like, that's not how it works for me, Marnie, which is fine. <laughs> but, but I have seen sort of a junior version of that for folks that are not getting a true, you know, quarterly business review. I mean, I think at this point, Marnie, I think you and I are pretty aligned in that it, it's just a mousetrap. It's just a new problem. It's a new <laughs> equation that I need to figure out. So at the end of the day, uh, everyone at this point, I think, knows that I'm not a best practice guy. I, I don't think any of your businesses should just solely operate off best practices. It's how do you want to make your services? That's the fun about owning a business is I can do it whatever way I want as long as I'm making sure that I'm making some level of profitability off of it. So if you want to do it this way or you want to do it that way, we can figure that math out. The math is easy, right? I mean, your P&L will speak for all of this stuff, not your PSA. Yeah. So kind of to the question that Cody asked, or I think it was uh, Sean about having multiple VCIOs, to me, right, that equation really just comes into, is it budgeted in your pricing to have, you know, two hours of VCIO a month or one hour of VCIO a month? And yeah, your VCIOs will scale based off of your revenue. Now it's a revenue to salary ratio, which means I just manage them off of utilization. And they pay now, for themselves. Go, go they pay for them. Well, it's not that they... <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's it's not even pay for themselves, right? Like it's it's just included in your offering. Yeah. Like it's something that is part of like your SLAs to an extent, right? You're saying that you get one hour. Now, if you don't put it in part of your budget and it's not a part of your pricing, that is where a lot of us have knee jerked into account management because you're trying to justify this extra business expense now, right? It's not a cog. This is now an expense on your business. And now the only way that I can pay for that is to increase gross margin or increase my revenue. And if Mike you don't know how to read a P&L, then attend my session at MSP GeekCon. 
<laughs> I, I'm going to be looking for the VCIO line item on there. Yeah. yeah. There it is. Um, and I, I'm just reading uh, uh, Bruce's yes, uh, comment comments. here. And, um, <laughs> Bruce Wayne. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I mean he's a night owl and like still getting up early to to right. be honest. This is great. Um Alex's Batman Ninja Lego. Yep. Yeah, I mean great great point. Like, you know, the um it seems like echoing um some things that um you three are saying that this is really um putting uh uh the, the, the clients uh the, that their organization's needs first. Um Versus going in with an agenda already established of, hey, we need to upsell X, Y, and Z. Oh, now I'm going to say bring an agenda, but maybe not a goal. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with what you're saying. You mean the hidden agenda of just sell, sell, sell. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. right. I think that's what SS asked about, you know, should the account managers and VCIOs right. be in the same meetings? To me, the account manager should be having a meeting with the VCIO to discuss what he wants to upsell the client. Right. Why do you need to bring the client in? If they're now the gatekeeper, the CIO, the trusted advisor, the consultants, the ninja, whatever, whatever you're going to use for that terminology, right? It's just marketing. Most of your titles at the end of the day are marketing. It's how the client is going to perceive it. So that account manager should be upselling the VCIO on those services and try to convince them to buy it. And if they convince them to buy it, then they go to the client and say, hey, there's something that wasn't on the roadmap we got to talk about. <clears throat> but that's not to say that the, that the account manager shouldn't be in some of the strategy sessions because they're really the representative of the MSP, making sure the MSP is involved and aware and you know they can go back and manage the account and go back and talk to service yeah. delivery and make sure that service knows what the client's working on that may be outside of what happens at the MSP, but they need to have visibility into. There's a new piece of tech coming where you know, new copiers are coming in and the, the, the CIOs arranged all of that. They've, they've managed the contract, they've made it all happen. Everything's coming through the door, but somebody needs to let service know. Um, and that's really where the account manager relationship happens. Um, I'm going to ask, I, I, I did, uh, um, because Adam, I listen, um, I pay attention. I'm, I'm going to grant your request. Um, can we ask everyone, uh, who's doing VCIO onsite versus remote? Um, so, uh, here, launch a poll and, um, let us know. I mean, uh, yeah, the, both the pins, like it's kind of a cheat answer, but I'm, I'm sure this very much you know, are your clients nearby? You know, I mean, it probably uh, has a lot of factors, but um, any opinions from uh, the panel here? Uh, does this, is this preferable to be really in person? I mean, I guess frequency, like there's a lot of factors, but there's a lot of think? factors. There's a lot that can be done remote, but how are you going to go sit with an employee at an organization and learn what their workflow look like, looks like to help them automate and improve and streamline workflows with technology? If you're sitting on the other end of the Zoom call and you don't see half the technology that they touch, right? VCIO is about more than just the keyboard. It's about more than just the PC. It's about all the technology they have in their organization. And I think to some extent, not to say you can't do it without being on site, but there's value in being on site and seeing and feeling the frustration or the, the struggles that an organization goes through. And it's interesting, the level of trust garnered. And when you're in a room one-on-one, -on -one, you end up being a trusted advisor in a different way. A lot of times when you get one-on-one -on -one conversation, because you're removed slightly from the company, right? So people trust you to have other conversations that might lead towards solutions that you might be able to provide for them. That doesn't often happen in a Zoom room when you're waiting for somebody to pop in, right? So if, if I'm on a one-on-one -on -one call versus if I'm in a room with someone where we're just waiting for someone to come in the room, I might get a different conversation than in a Zoom room where quite literally at any second, somebody might pop their head in. Well, and let's be real, right? Some people, everyone wants to be communicated with differently. We are interacting with humans. We are humans selling things to humans. We are relationship based. And I can tell you right now, sometimes on Zoom calls myself, I can't pay attention. I'm sitting there seeing message streams on the right and email. There's so many distractions. So if I'm dealing with a high level CEO where they are that kind of quick start mentality, they're not going to sit there and look at a Zoom call for 30 minutes while you show my PowerPoint slide on their technology roadmap, get them in a room to where they then all of a sudden are going, Oh shit, I got to pay attention. Yep. All right. So we, we're, uh, uh, got about 20 minutes left and there's a couple of things we want to do. Um, we also want to give out some prizes. So, uh, everybody stick around, but Marnie, let me tee you up. Um, let's take this from us. Um, 
just jabbering about it. And let's let's get a little bit more tactical. And uh, you got something that you want to show? Yeah. Well, we are pretty excited that um, we just launched a Ninja um, integration into Lifecycle Insights. So. You know, Alex and I, again, we talk to MSPs all day, every day, and we hear that some of the times prepping for those business review meetings, um, that the prep time is what keeps folks from getting into an automatic cadence uh, that everyone deserves because they're cobbling together um, reports from different places, et cetera. And it, the, it, that, the prep time alone is staggering for folks. It was one of the things that that Alex had brought to the table when he said we should create life cycle insights, right? It took, it takes too much time to prep for business reviews when all the information should be in one place. And the other pieces, account managers, VCIOs don't have one place to look from. So we aim to solve that problem. And uh, we always start with some data. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're looking to start with data and then help you drive those strategic conversations. And now if you're an engine RMM partner, uh, we have a primary integration just for you. So we're pretty excited about that. So I'll spend five minutes because I know we have prizes and I don't want to get in the way of prizes. Um, just showing you a bit about how that works for us. And if anybody ever wants to chat with me or Alex, we are more than happy to do so. So one of the things we do, plug into Ninja RMM or for the record, your PSA or IT documentation platform as well. So lots of ways we can get the data. And we aim to help you drive those two um, inventories that I mentioned earlier. So an asset list and a user list. Uh, we clean up your data with warranty lookups on Dell, Lenovo, HP, Meraki, and Cisco SmartNet. Um, and then we also help to drive user reporting. So where you could see folks that are not in your PSA, um, but are in Microsoft 365, for example, and why is MFA disabled? It's interesting, if, if we're not at least having this accurate information to help drive a budget forecast, as well as some of the cyber conversations, you're starting off on shaky foundation to start. We've talked a lot about, as a matter of fact, Kyle right out of the gate said, if you're strategic, you're delivering a budget to your partners. So that was one of the primary goals of Lifecycle Insights is to get a budget out the door. So we allow folks, so we automate the asset reporting. We drive, um, you can add third-party contracts. Alex and I talk about this all the time. The technology services that small businesses are paying for are not just about your managed service agreement. There are third-party vendors, cybersecurity insurance policies, line of business applications, printer copier services, phone services, all of those things are driving that broader perspective. And if you truly want to be the strategic partner, you need to include all of that in the budget. So all of those pieces, along with your recommendations, build a budget forecast, right? And we recommend our partners deliver both a short-term one, a 12-month tactical, here's every asset and when Gloria in accounting is going to get her computer swapped out, as well as a five-year wide-angle guest budget. Um, I talked to a partner this morning who really wanted to convert from hardware replacement to hardware as a service and wanted to know how to help budget for that. So that's kind of the automation piece, along with some additional reporting around some of our other integrations to help drive some of the, con uh, the conversation for partners. So that's the automation bits and pieces that we include in Lifecycle Insights. But the other piece, and all of us have discussed this, is the risk conversation. And you need to discuss um, where they are at risk, what are the problems for their business, because that is what drives the CEO's attention more than individual line items of flux capacitors and gadgets, et cetera, that you're going to sell to them. So to have conversations uh, in red, yellow, green of where they're at risk um, and where they need to align better to your best practices um, it really helps drive the conversation. Um, I just want to show one piece around this. I think everyone knows every everyone that's gone to, to school has taken a test and gotten a score on it. So that's what this looks and feels like. But one thing that's really important is to be able to say, OK, right now, Kyle, you're at a 40 percent in terms of technology health. What? But I knew Kyle was that. an underachiever. <laughs> uh, but what we're recommending to you today, right? 
um, will drive the needle to a 72%. Or it could be last quarter, you were at a 40%. We've done all this work. This is what we've done for you lately. But so I only made 1% a month? Man. <laughs> Even more importantly is once we've scored the assessment, and this is where we see the VCIO work all of the time. This is the VCIO then takes the scored assessment and makes recommendations. And whether they're the one delivering the conversation or the account manager is varies, right? Based on the conversations we've had, but to be able to say, we're going to solve these business pains for you by getting rid of these assets, we've got some other costs associated to it, but this is going to drive our recommendation roadmap. That's the place where MSPs are having conversations. So business goals that drive recommendations that drive the budget forecast. You mentioned Trisha earlier, Jonathan, this is where she has her conversations. She talks about their business goals with technology aligned recommendations that therefore the conclusion is budget that is pre-approved. And she doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about individual line items on quotes because she's already set that conversation uh, along the way. So hopefully I did it in my five minutes. I have, I could talk about this for days for sure, um, but I'll stop there and see where the conversation takes us. Where do I sign up? <laughs> oh, let me put in the chat exactly where you can sign. Thanks for asking, Kyle. You're funny. I'm going to buy right uh, now. Have, we do have a free trial for folks who want to give it a whirl. <laughs> I put the pricing page in, in the link. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, and there's, um, you know, we've got, I'll drop a link into um, our uh, Ninja One Discord group. Um, there's also, we're on MSB Geek. Um, we have our own channel there. Jump in there. Um, I know we got lots of partners using Lifecycle. Um, if you got questions around what they're doing. Um, but yeah, let, let, uh, yeah, hit, hit the questions and definitely check it out. Very excited that um, Marnie and Alex got their devs on, on, uh, uh, working on that and and that it's available now very cool integration very exciting so thank yeah. you for sharing that yeah all We're right excited to have ninja partners it was the number one request right it was not hard that is how we take all of our requests is by votes so you know as people send in tickets or, or go on our website and chat with us like when we have a ninja rmm it was very clear that we needed one because uh lots of votes for it it took me a long time to create all those fake profiles. <laughs> well, I'm glad it worked. It out. worked. So well done. I thought it was worth it. ROI. Um, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let me let me show. Um, we are going to give out uh, uh, prices to three uh, Lothi folks. I'll, I'll show um, what that's going to be. Um, we did this last year too for our IT Love Fest. It's it's um, you get to pick your own subscription box, and so we got three different choices for you three months of Fuego box, which is uh, a, a selection <laughs> of hot sauces. You get uh, three, a box with three um, hot sauces and you'll get three months of that. Or you can get three months of Bark Box <laughs> If you've got um, a furry friend in your life, um, you can you can treat them and give them three months of Bark Box, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, last but not least, six bags of trade coffee. Um, I actually use this one coffee kind of important these days any day um so that that's what we're giving out we're gonna give it to three people um and we're gonna choose those people uh in, in just a minute we want to play a little game first and this involves some audience participation so um i'm gonna ask our panelists not to cheat and um here's how you 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 uh, refrain from cheating you don't click the link that i'm about to put in the chat everybody else should but you should treat this like a suspicious link. Don't, uh, don't click it. Um, oh, everybody else. As I do with all links that you ship my yeah. way. So fair. Oh, don't look at that preview either. Not looking at the preview. Alex, don't look at it. You really? Right. Like that, that's the worst thing you could tell like the three of us is don't right? do this. <laughs> okay. It's a really right. tiny preview if that helps any. Okay, good. Okay, so no um, audience, um, what we have here uh don't yeah until you zoom in um okay audience also no no uh giving them uh hints or anything so what we're gonna do here is we have three mystery clients um that we want to put in front of our panel here and 
this is kind of like the matchmaking matchmaking game. Uh, basically, you are going to ask, uh, take turns. Each the three of you can ask uh, uh, each of these three uh, mystery clients one question each, and then at the end of that round, you're going to decide uh, whether you want to be asked them. Will, can I be your C uh, VCIO? And so um, let's let's start this out. I'll show you uh, first of all. I'll show you the the three clients. I'm giving you a little bit of a hint, and let's set some ground rules too. So these three are all. Let's just pretend that they're all going to be in your location that you do. Uh, provide services to, to each of these types of client. Um, so nothing's going to be automatically ruled out that way. So we got mystery client number one. All you get right now before asking questions is, this is a dental group. Uh, okay, mystery client number two. This is a mid-size accounting firm. And finally, last but not least, mystery client number three, a tech startup. Ooh. They're all making the news these days for not very good reasons. Okay. So, um, Kyle, let's start with you. Um, which mystery client would you like to ask a question to? Everyone doesn't like the dental group, so I'm going to take the dental group. <laughs> I know. I, fig I figured, like, uh, the dental group, I, I figured that would be a, a popular one with the audience. Okay. So, the dental group, what do you want to ask this dental group? What do I would like to ask? How much did you spend on IT last year? Ooh, okay. Um, great question. And they do not have an immediate answer for you. Their answer uh, is, um, well, they give you we, a little bit of context here. We paid for internet. <laughs> they, yeah, they have been using, they have um, uh, one of the partners has a nephew who's been loosely managing IT for them. Mm. So there's not really an official budget that they have. Um, and they've realized that, okay, they actually need, the nephew is like going on to, to uh, uh, work for an AI chatbot or something. And so um, they, they need to figure something out. So I get to ask another question? Um, let's kick it over. I think um, let's stick with this one. And now, Marnie, you can ask uh, the dental group another question. Yeah, so I am curious what you consider your competitive differentiator as a dentist in my area. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. They uh, consider themselves to be um, basically the like they have been in their community um, offering dental services for years and years. And so they um, uh, consider themselves to be kind of like the hometown uh, favorites. They have uh, deep uh, roots, you would might say, um, with, with the community. And they feel like they have a lot of um, uh, referral business. If you want it, yeah. They may not be the flashiest. I, I do have a follow-up. I know what I'll say next when I'm when I'm offered the opportunity. So thank okay. you. All right, um, Alex, what do you want to ask the dental group? I want to know what it is about technology that keeps them up at night. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. I almost said, "Don't say this one." Alex is going to say, "What keeps you up at night?" I asked the lawyers that one. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, what keeps the dental group up at night? Um, they have heard about other partners in the area being impacted by uh, security events. And they also know, have an inkling that the way that they've been uh, hitting their HIPAA compliance um, has not really been up to par. And that's a kind of a ticking time bomb. So that, those are the two things that are, that are keeping them up at night. All right. Um, so, so I'm curious, knowing that it's five of, do we want to continue with the just the dentist, or do you want to do all three of them? Let's go rapid fire. Five. I know Alex has to jump. I'm going to give you one more piece of context about the dental group. Um, they have had multiple acquisitions of offices, um, and they have a very diverse ecosystem now. Um, okay. So that's that's your first option, uh, uh, whether you think that's a winner or not. <coughs> um, here, let's go right into mystery client number two. Um, let me give you a little bit of background for them. 
Um, so they um, have just uh, uh, gotten their cyber, cyber insurance renewal form, and they are frustrated and concerned. Um, so they are they were using a um, a popular uh, alternative to managed services that was uh, uh, forty dollars a seat that was pitched as a very user friendly, um, uh, quick, streamlined way to to get support. Um, and they have a fleet of uh, end user devices well beyond um, their normal life cycle for business use. Um, so okay, any questions? What do you got, Kyle? What do I got? I got a fun one. I used to do CPAs as well. If I was to have walked into your office last March during tax season, what type of sentiments would I hear from your CPAs about their computers and working with a cert? Oh, there's a lot of cursing. It's a complete fire. <laughs> like everything is madness. So, th so they would have personally, personally uh, caused some physical harm to their IT people if they had walked in that office? <laughs> Um, I mean, not long-term harm, I don't think, but yeah, would, you would have had to have some good reflexes, I think. <laughs> um, uh, Marnie, what do you got? As we review the cybersecurity insurance form, my question for you is, um, what would happen to your business if you were breached and all of your client data was exposed for the world to see, what impact would that have on your business? I mean, you tell me, but like it, it would, it, it seems like it would be not great at all. Um, reputational damage would be crazy. Um, they're honestly more concerned with, um, uh, potential, like, you know, not being able to be insured and, and fines and things like that. So, yeah, so, so, so being able to respond to this insurance form positively is a high priority for you. Yes. Yes. They are being pulled, kicking and screaming, uh, screaming towards this. Yeah. So that Roger leads that. to my question, which is what's going to happen to your organization if for some reason you can't qualify for cyber insurance? I mean, it's <laughs> are we just going to go without it or are we, are we dedicated to this? No, we're dedicated to, to doing it. Um, I think a couple of years ago, the answer probably would have been like, eh, we're going to roll the dice. All right, um, Alex, you have to run in two minutes. So we'll, we'll let you ask the first question and then uh, we're going to get your take. Uh, so the mystery client number three, this is the tech startup. Um, okay, so they're about 100 employees. Uh, they are feeling pressure to make some cuts. Maybe you've seen some headlines, but they also still need to level up their maturity. Um, they're interested in co-managed, what, what you've got going on there. Um, and, uh, they're, uh, yeah, they, they do have a budget, but basically it's, it's rough. It's like, they just want to spend less than a full, uh, full-time employee. Um, and they're just looking to, uh, to move fast. Yeah. My, my question for a tech startup is how they go about securing all the things that happen outside of their borders, their AWS, their cloud, their, all the, all of their cloud instances, those kind of things. What's in place today to inventory and secure those types of products. Um, there is, uh, basically they have a, a DevOps guy and, uh, is using all sorts of, uh, flashy tools for it, but this is all homegrown. Uh, Marnie, what do you think? Um, I would like to ask them what their appetite for risk is. I know that tech startups are, um, you know, fast and furious, and clearly we will have identified quite a few risks along the way. And what is your appetite for carrying that risk and exposure for yourself? Um, they have a pretty healthy appetite for risk. They're mostly concerned right now. They're honestly, their, their big thing is um, uh, being asked to cut costs um, and still show that they're, they're not, um, uh, yeah, the risk profile is moderately aggressive. Um, all right. Uh, cause Alex, I know you need to leave. Let's get your answer real quick. Um, and then Kyle just throw it in chat. Me. It's uh, it's all down there. So we're going to walk away from the, uh, from the dentist. We're going to try and sell the accountants and we're going to run like our hair is on fire. Is this a fuck, Mary kill? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm leaving on that note. Uh, yeah, we'll get your answer for that. <laughs> <also>. in the <laughs> email. Oh man. All right. Okay. Um, Kyle, what else do you want to ask the tech startup? And then I want to get, um, I'm, I'm going to create a poll and get everyone else's uh, on, the, on the line, their decision, um, what, which one you, they would go with too. 
Um, yeah, Kyle, what, what do you want to ask tech start startup? I would probably ask something effective. What is currently your budget approval process for new tools, AKA how many new invoices have come across your desk that your developer paid for that you had no idea existed? Mm. <sighs> Great question. Again, I think I would go back to, um, the, the, this is all very, um, uh, homegrown. Basically they have the, the DevOps person who, um, uh, presents to uh, the, the CEO and maybe, maybe they have some advisors um, in terms of like their, their VC or something like that, that, that can help them review. So you have no idea what tools your devs are buying then? No, nope. Not clear. <laughs> okay. Let me ask this uh, in the, in the poll real quick. Um, okay. We got the, we got our dental dental group. We have our accounting uh, firm and we've got our tech startup. Um, okay. I've created this poll. Um, I've opened it and now I'm going to pull it on screen. Um, so everybody, what, what would you do? Um, and, uh, Marnie, um, which one are we saw Alex's answer. He's picking the accounting yeah. firm. Which one yeah. do you want to provide VCI services for? Um, so it's interesting because my dentist loves his managed service provider and I know no one wants to sell the dentist <laughs> dental group, but honestly, I saw just brilliance at the dentist office um, when I was there the last time and his enthusiasm and he is currently taking out the uh, hometown favorite with the technology because he's nice. gotten rid of the old pink impressions and he's really enthusiastic about how technology is saving them costs and actually making them the best dentist in our town. So believe it or not, I'm going to go like potentially off the rails and pick the dental group. I love it. I love it. In, in researching this, I've got like some amazing Reddit threads talking about dental groups um, and rants and stuff. <laughs> Um, but, but no, I, I love it. And I mean, my, my uh, dentist is, is much the same, um, definitely leaning into technology and, and, um, uh, getting folks like me. So, um, Kyle, what do you think? Yeah. You as dentists are get, as younger dentists are entering the market, right. They're, they're wanting the tech cause that's what the dental schools are starting to promote. But if we're talking about VCIO services, I'm yeah. going to pick the tech startup because I think they have the most opportunity for true high level consulting. And at the end of the day, I also want MSPs to grow, be fat, be hungry, or and and to really be, you know, succeed. And tech startups gonna have a lot of opportunity, aka you're gonna have quite a bit of profitability built into a client like that with their budget. So to me, yep. I'm going tech startup. Nice, yeah. I mean, there is, um, you know, they're funded. Um, there's money there. Also, there's the 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 unlike the other two. Uh, technical debt and legacy stuff, you're kind of walking in. I mean, there's some stuff in place, but you're walking into more of a clean slate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this poll, uh, but most folks are going accounting firm. Um, and um, oh yeah, Tristan. Th uh, I, thanks everybody for those who have to run. Uh, this has been great. I did want to bring in um, just to you, let you know uh, the names of the, of the, um, the, the companies that you're taking on um, <laughs> that you're going to be okay. matched with here. So let me uh, go back, take off this, um, this poll. Thanks for filling that out. And let me share my screen really quickly. So Marnie, you can see, um, and I like that, that you each picked a different one. So there's no fighting over them. So that's, that's, nice. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, okay. So let's see here. Bring this on screen. Okay. So, um, Marnie, you are the proud VCIO of You Can't Handle the Tooth Dental Group. Nice. <laughs> I'm very excited. I love it. <laughs> I, I'm really looking forward to the changes that you're going to walk them through. Um, and then Alex is working with It's a Cruel World <laughs> Accounting. Nice. And then finally, Kyle, you're working with Pied Piper, which I've heard Whoa. some really, really interesting things about. You know, Jonathan, what, what was his name? Eric it. something. I mean, <laughs> the Belson box signature box. Or <laughs> like, um, yeah. Um, Ehrlich, yeah. There we go. um, yeah. So congrats. So before, uh, we, uh, we got to give away these prizes, but before we do this, um, one last thing, um, any other things you want to provide in terms of like the context, the questions that you're asking, things that you're looking out for, um, to leave some folks with when they're thinking about VCIO 
and thinking about making matches with their clients, any kind of like uh, rationale behind your questions or higher level like takeaways you want to leave people with? Well, I certainly will. For those of you that I haven't met before, I'm non-technical, right? I was not an MSP. I don't pretend to play one on TV, but I was a consultant. Uh, so I always drive for the differentiators, the business outcomes, and then let the technology fall as it may. And I would highly recommend the book Getting Naked by Patrick Lencioni, which really helps kind of defeat the imposter syndrome. If you're thinking like, how can I go consult when I don't know all the things in the world about a dentist, um, but still drive strategic conversations and business outcomes, again, aligned to the technology initiatives. So that's why I picked more strategic, like what is your competitive differentiator type of questions. Also, Kyle and Alex could both just completely swamp me in technical conversations that I didn't even dare to go touch. I, uh, for, for those who uh, didn't want to Google naked, uh, getting naked <laughs> book, um, <laughs> I, I, I did it for you and I've got a link for you right there. Kyle, um, what about you? Any other things that you want to leave for takeaways? For me, when it comes to VCIO services or any additional services for your MSP, I think there needs to be a level of intention that you need to have and a level of discipline with that intention to where you need to figure out in the next X number of months, what level of services do I want to offer and how does that gradient scale? A lot of times, I think we just try to check the box and, and do what our competitors are doing, which then leads us to doing things either half-baked or wonder why when we do it fully baked, why we're not making any money. So to me, the, you know, this is a very, um, a, a very different type of service than just offering some type of fractional help desk or fractional IT. So you know, if you are going to dive in and use something like Lifecycle Insights, you're going to get a massive ROI out of it. You just have to own it and be willing to go through a traditional product lifecycle to make it lucrative. So it's that level of that adoption, right? Don't buy something that you're going to implement 20%, implement, buy something you're going to fully invest to implement 100%. Yeah, it, it's too often that I see, you know, these things just get out there and you wonder why it sucks when you gave it two minutes of attention. <laughs> and if I'm going to do a book recommendation, um, I'm going to follow Marnie's lead. What should I uh, have? There's like a whole list on my website of what you have I to read as my client. So many. Yeah. Um, for me, actually, what might be really relevant to this conversation, because we talked about owner-led sales, the book I've been recommending the most right now is Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Because I think a lot of us as owners want to be the implementers and the product developer of ECIO services, but it might be a good exercise to hire a who to figure out the how for ECIO services so you can guarantee that it'll have the time and attention. Well, uh, great recommendation, Kyle. And I'm actually dropping the link um, to your larger reading list uh, since that's called out. I'm also going to drop a, one last link. Um, this is to a YouTube playlist where you did some, you and I did some videos all around being intentional with your, uh, your business planning um, as an MSP. So everyone should definitely check that out. Um, okay, now the moment we've been waiting for, uh, these folks may have run or they may still be here, but we've got our three uh, winners for the subscription boxes. Um, congratulations to Russell Swimney, Jim Timber, Timberman, and Peter Slater. Um, we will be following nice up with you, even if you're not still sticking around, um, we will be following up with you in the email to, to give you your subscription boxes. So congrats on that. I'm sorry, Bruce. Um, <laughs> Bruce, you've got, you're, you're the, you're the man who has it all anyway. I mean, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. And thank you for the swag request. Actually. Yeah. Any kind of swag request, send my way. Um, the, uh, let me send one more thing before we all say goodbye and thank you so much uh kyle and marnie for sticking around uh the last thing i'm going to send around unless there's other things that um you, you want me to shout out um i'm going to send an invite to our discord group so this is um our ninja one users discord group uh come drop in uh it's a it's a pretty friendly place and a lot of great folks there who are smart a lot of technical questions but also um, business related stuff too so so hop on in <laughs> all right bruce is gonna go uh, tear it up with the batmobile um that sounds like a plan to me um thank you everybody uh in the audience for for making this a great session thank you marnie thank you kyle and thank you. take care everyone we'll see you again soon thanks thanks thank you guys <laughs>